Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. We are continuing our series in the churches that Jesus writes to in the book of Revelation. Last week we finished up with the church in Sardis. Now we are talking about the church in Philadelphia. First thing I thought when I read this is it should be the church in Pittsburgh. But we're going to leave it at Philadelphia. Revelation chapter 3, starting at verse 7. It says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia writes, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are, who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is coming upon the whole earth to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Now we're going to go through about half of this today and then continue this up next week. But as we can tell, the church in Philadelphia, this is the church that God had nothing but accolades for. Uh, A little bit about Philadelphia before we start. It's about 25 miles southeast of Sardis. Now we think... At least I do sometimes. When you think in mileage, you think 25 miles, okay, that's about half an hour. That's about half an hour if you're driving on a highway at 60 miles an hour. 25 miles on a goat path walking or maybe through a wooded area is quite a distance. So when, when John walks to these areas to deliver these churches, it's quite a distance he's traveling. There was a main road that connected many of the various cities that but none of them ran straight through anything. They had to go different ways to get there. Philadelphia was surrounded by many industries, such as leather, vineyards, textiles, and it was also a very prosperous city. And we know it now as a city of brotherly love. It was actually the, the term Philadelphus means brother lover. And it was named after its founder, the Pergamian king Attalus, around 150 B.C., and it was named such because of this king's love for his brother. That's where it came to know its name. Now, not long after that was founded, it was destroyed by an earthquake in 17 A.D. It was rebuilt, but when, it, when they rebuilt the city, a lot of people moved away from the city. It became more of a, a suburb setting than a main metropolitan area. It became an inner city, and everyone had moved away from the, the earthquake area to the suburbs, And that was the area around the city. Now, the letter was written around 95 AD. So you had a lot of folks living outside the city, but you had a a minority of them living in the city. You would call it today an inner city church or an inner city uh, place. The people in that town were very skittish of any kind of tremor because they knew what happened with the first rumor. So they, they would leave at the slightest vibration. And as as time went on, the city was being evacuated, more and more people moving to the suburbs. Now, we don't know where this church was in the city, whether it was in the higher plains or the lower plains, but since it was associated with the inner city part, we assume it was in the lower part of the city. So let's look at this verse by verse. The first verse, verse 7, says this, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David, What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Now, we read that verse, and it doesn't, when I first read it, it didn't mean a lot to me. But think about this. God is reassuring the people of something that they already know to be true. Do you ever need to be reassured of something that you've probably learned in the past, but you either forgot it, or you think it doesn't apply to you anymore. You know, we sang that song this morning. Um, 
My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Now, how many times have we sung that song or even the old hymn that's associated with the song? But think about that truth. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. You know what that means? That means we're not judged by what we do. We're judged on what Jesus already did. Imagine the, the relief you get from that. You feel like you blew it today. You feel like, ah, I'm just not living the way I should be. I know I'm messing up. I want to love Jesus more, but I just, it's not working out for me. Your hope is built on Jesus' blood and righteousness, not on your performance. How many of you love your kids based on how they perform? We love them, regardless of how they perform. Sometimes you need to be reassured of something that you already know to be true. And when Jesus says to them, no one can open it if I open it and no one can shut it if I shut it. Everything in God's word has a meaning and purpose. When he writes those, he's assuming the church already knows that information, but he's drawing it to the fact that he is identifying himself as the Messiah. When he says those two phrases, no one can shut it and no one can open it, he is basically quoting scriptures from the Old Testament. Hosea 11.9 says, For I am God, not man, the Holy One among you. Jeremiah 10.10 Oh, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God, the eternal King. He wants to remind them by these sayings that he is still on the throne. He is still God. He is still all controlling. Nothing that they do is in vain. Remember when John the Baptist was in jail and he kind of was beginning to doubt and Luke 719 says, John the Baptist asked, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Now, John the Baptist, if you remember what Jesus says, there was no one greater than him. And yet, he was doubting of whether this was Christ or not, Messiah. Everyone comes to a point where we doubt things at times. Everyone comes to a point where we really have to remember things we've been taught as a younger believer, maybe, and things that as life goes on, we kind of forget or we think we misunderstood them. We all need to be reminded of something we know to be true. And the takeaway from that is, if you're doubting that right now, if you're doubting it now, God is still the person whom you can fully trust to do anything. When Keith was up here for prayer time, he felt that God was doing something. And it's true. God was doing a work in everyone's life. That's what we pray every morning. That's what we come expecting. But I think a lot of that times is not something that's miraculous per se, but I think a lot of times it's just the Holy Spirit encouraging you and encouraging me with something that we already knew, that Jesus is still the one true God and he is totally, totally trustworthy with everything that goes on. Do we trust him or not? Do we trust what he says or not? If he says, I will never leave you or forsake you, do we believe it? If he says, no one's going to take you out of my hand, do we believe that? And the whole point of the first sentence is Jesus knows you have those doubts. Don't sweat it. We did a series on Wednesday night a while ago called Faith and Doubt. And the whole point of the book was it's okay to have doubt because doubt forces you to check it out. Doubt forces you to go find what the answer really is. And when you have doubts about your faith, it forces you to go find out it to be true. And the more you read God's word, the more the doubts are eliminated. And God does that through not only his word, but through the Holy Spirit ministering his word to you. Having doubts is not a sin. However, the enemy wants to use those doubts to defeat you. 
And that's why Jesus comes in to say, look, I'm the one who opens the door. I'm the one who closes the door. No one can change it. I'm the eternal, omnipotent God. I can do everything. The phrase goes on and says, who holds the key of David? What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. That is basically a quote from Isaiah 22. It says, in that day I will summon my servant Elkiah, son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and for- fasten your sash around him and hand your authority over to him. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem and to the house of Judea. I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. The keys symbolize the authority that this king now has. He gives the keys to those whom he trusts. And he delegates his authority to those he trusts. But what he's saying to this church is, I'm not delegating it right now. I have the authority. I have the power. And if I say it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. How many of you have a a promise book, God's promise book? How many of you read that and really believe those promises? Or do you read them sometimes and think, well, maybe that's not for me. Or maybe that's not for today. When Jesus says, I have the authority and everything I say is true, that means we can take it to the bank that those promises are true. I tried to write this in a way that the bender paraphrase, I call it. It's not scriptural, but I try to get the point across. It would sound something like this. I am the Holy One, the perfect God who does all things well. I am the true God, one who is faithful to do all I have said. I have the authority over every situation. There is nothing I cannot control. I am the one who begins things that man cannot stop and stop things that man cannot revive. Think about each of those sentences real quickly. The first one, it says, when the the perfect God says he does all things well, it eliminates the thought in our mind that maybe God missed something. And maybe God's not doing it the way it should be done. When he says, I do all things well, which is actually a scripture verse, I do all things well, that means everything that is happening is not maybe not well for you, but in God's plan, it's well. I was telling the teens today that that as parents, our goal is not to be friends with our kids. Our goal is to be parents. And when the kids ask me, well, what, doesn't that mean my parents can't be my friend? I said, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying a friend will let you do whatever you want them to do and go wherever you want to go and whatever you want to do, that's fine. I said, a parent will make choices that you may not like and do things that you may not think are right. And at the time, you may not like what they're doing. And you might even get mad at them and yell at them and say, I hate you. But guess what? Still as a parent, you do things that you believe are the best for your kids. You do it well. When God does things in our life, we may not like them, we may not agree with them, we may get mad. But if God's love for us is perfect and he does all things well, then whatever is happening is still under God's authority and he's allowing it to happen for some reason. We don't know what it is, but we have to trust that God, if he loves us perfectly, then whatever is happening to us, God can work for good and God knows what he's doing. That in itself should be an encouragement for anything. If God loves me, and a lot of bad things are happening to me right now, it doesn't negate God's love for me. It doesn't mean God left me. It doesn't mean God's necessarily punishing me. It just means that something is happening that God is allowing to happen for whatever reason, but I know that if he loves me, the reason is going to be good at some point. How many of you have ever hired a professional to do something in your home? remodel, fix, whatever. You know that that professional hopefully has the skill to finish what he starts, right? 
you hire him and you believe that whatever it looks like before it's done, you know it's going to be perfect when it's finished. You have the confidence that regardless of what it looks like in process, it's going to look good when it's done. We like to watch those home improvement shows. How many of you ever watch those, you know, tear a house down and rebuild it, make it look perfect? And they show you scenes along the way. And you look at those things going, how is that ever going to be nice? That is, that is just, there's no way. But in the end, it's like, whoa, you did an awesome job on that. A lot of times we look only at what God's doing as he's working now. Like when the house is halfway finished. We don't get to see the end until the actual end comes. And we, we look at what's happening now as, as the end when it's not. God's going to finish what he starts in our life. Whatever what's happening, whatever we're facing right now, we know that the end product of our lives will be great. The second point of that verse was, I am the true God, one who is faithful to do all he has said. Do you ever think that God has not lived up to his promise? How many have ever thought that? Come on, we probably all have. Or God's promises just aren't working for me. God's telling this church who was facing trouble and they did not see an end in sight. He's telling them, I'm still faithful. Don't quit. It doesn't seem good right now, but trust me, I'm still faithful. I will finish what I started. The third one, I have the authority over every situation. There's nothing I cannot control. Sometimes we need to be reminded of God's promise. Things often appear sometimes to be out of control. No matter what we do, it doesn't seem to help. In fact, maybe what we do makes it worse at times. But God says, there is nothing I can't do and nothing I don't have control over. That gives me comfort. Because if God is in control of it, it's not going to get to the point where God's out of control with it. It's not up to me. When I take my car to the shop or I have someone come to the house to do something, the end result is not up to me. The end result is up to the person who's doing the job. God's doing the job in me. How it turns out is not really up to me. It's what God does through me that matters. Number four, I am the one who begins things that man cannot stop and stop things that man cannot revive. Can you name for me one thing that God started that man can't stop regardless? There's a couple of them. But the most obvious one is the church. God started the church. And what's the Bible say? The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Matthew 16, 18 says, I tell you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Do we take comfort in the fact that if God wants to do it, regardless of what we think or how we feel about a situation, or even what the facts tell us, are we confident that God can do it? Are we confident in praying, believing that God hears us and that God can affect that type of a change? It may be something that is so out of the realm of possibility that unless God does it, it's not going to get done. There are things that God can start that no matter what happens, man cannot stop it. How many times has the church tried to to have been eradicated by man? Man, since the beginning of the church, has tried to destroy the church as a, as a body. Has not worked, will not work, ever. Now on the flip side of that, if there's something that God does not want to happen, there's nothing we can get or to do to make it happen. Back to Hebrews 13.5 says, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. If that's true, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. That means no matter what we do, 
what happens? God does not leave you. God does not forsake you. There is nothing that I can do or you can do to change that. So if you think your life isn't exactly what God wants it to be, I will never leave you or forsake you. You think God will never take you back? I will never leave you or forsake you. I try to put all that back together again as a, again, another paraphrase. See if we can write it this way. Dear Dover Assembly, I want to let you know that even in your, if your situation causes you not to feel like it, I am still the holy God, the one who is forever. I am also the true God. Don't let anyone convince you that what I promise isn't true. You see, I have the authority to do whatever I want. I am more than able to meet your needs regardless of what may be going on around you. There may be many struggles and opponents in your life, but they have no power over you. I control even the bad things. Nobody can change what I want to do for you. Does that sound a little bit better? The second part of that verse, verse 8, says, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know, that, I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. This is the one church that has only commendations for their, their faithfulness. He has no rebuke and no correction for this church. And sometimes we forget that God knows and cares about everything and remembers everything. Whether we feel like it or not, whether we feel like God acknowledges what we do, or we think that God doesn't care, God tells them, I know what you're doing, and I care about it. I know the ministries you carry out. I know how you struggle. I know the things that nobody else knows. Think about your own personal life. I know what you do. I know what you struggle with. I know the things that nobody else knows. Is that a scary thought? Or is that a good thought? It should be a good thought. Because even though there may be things in our life that we don't want anyone else to know, the good news is God knows them and he still loves you. So the worst thing that you've ever done in your life that you're afraid and ashamed, don't want anyone to ever find out, God knows it. And he still loves you. He's never going to forsake you. Hebrews 6.10 says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. God's telling the people in Philadelphia, I've opened a door for you. I've opened a door for ministry for you. Use it. Go through it. I've prepared the way for you to go through. He says, I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. I know that you don't think you have the resources or the strength to continue, but since you have remained faithful, don't give up. Keep my word. Don't deny me. You are still vital in my kingdom. You can still be used in a powerful way. I have a plan for you. Don't give up. Let me see if I can do the Bender translation again. I see what you've been doing and I'm impressed. In fact, I'm going to give you another assignment to, compete, to complete. Now, I don't want you to think that you can't do it, but you've been able to keep my word and not deny me in the face of the sin in this city. So yes, with me, you are able to accomplish it. Now let's put those two together. Dear Dover Assembly, I want to let you know that even if your situation causes you not to feel like it, I am still the holy God, the one who is forever. I am also the true God. Don't let anyone convince you that what I promise isn't true. You see, I have the authority to do whatever I want. I am more than able to meet your needs regardless of what may be going on around you. There may be many struggles and opponents in your life, but they have no power over you. I control even the bad things. Nobody can change what I want to do for you. I see what you've been doing and I'm impressed. In fact, I'm going to give you another assignment to complete. 
Now I think, now I know you don't think you can do it, but you've been able to keep my word and not deny me in the face of the sin in this city. So yes, with me, you are able to do it. God uses each person. God is able to use us to points and places that we can't even imagine or think that God could do it. This church was being beaten up by the town around them. Again, we are saying they were inner city church. Most of the people in that town wanted nothing to do with the Christians in that church. They were being persecuted. They were being shunned. As, as an inner city church, they didn't have a whole lot of resources or a whole lot of funds to do anything with. It was a big church that's now a smaller church. And God says, awesome. You're small in number, but you haven't given in. I know there's terrible temptation all around you. The whole city seems to be against this church, but you have kept faithful in spite of all of that. In fact, you've been so faithful, your job's not done. You have more to do, and I'm going to do it with you. In fact, we can change that whole bender paraphrase instead of saying, dear Dover Assembly, just put your name in there. Dear Jeff, dear Sue, dear John, I want you to know, even if your situation causes you not to feel like it, I'm still the holy God. Don't let anyone convince you that what I promise isn't true. Now imagine and remember that this was written not only to this church in Philadelphia who needed to hear that at that particular moment, but it was also written for any church at any point in time and was also written to each one of us individually because it applies to us individually. Imagine getting this letter in your mailbox. I was telling the kids in youth for Sunday school that way back before there was email and computers and texting, we actually used mailboxes. And when I was in college, I couldn't wait to go to the mailbox to see if I got any mail. And it was like a mad dash. Everyone ran to the mailbox to see if there was a letter in there. And most often there was no mail or just junk mail. But every time you got a letter from home, from your friends or from your girlfriend or whoever it was, you couldn't wait to open that letter. You couldn't wait to read it. And you'd get back and you'd pin it on your bulletin board or you lay it on your desk and you wouldn't just throw it away. You'd keep it. And you'd read it and you'd read it again and you'd read it again and you'd keep it. You'd put it in your book, open up and read it again. That's exactly what God's word is to you. It's God's letter to you personally so one last time on this bender paraphrase put your name in it imagine getting this letter in your mailbox addressed to you dear Jeff I want you to know that even if your situation causes you not to feel like it I am still the holy God the one who is forever and Jeff I am also the true God Don't let anyone convince you that what I promise isn't true. You see, Jeff, I have the authority to do whatever I want. I am more than able to meet your needs, regardless of what may be going on around you. And Jeff, there may be many struggles and opponents in your life, but they have no power over you. I control even the bad things. No one can stop or change what I want to do for you. I see what you've been doing, Jeff, and I'm impressed. In fact, I'm going to give you another assignment to complete. Now, I, don't think the, I know that you don't think you can do it, but you've been able to keep my word and not deny me in the face of the sin in this city, so yes, with me, you're able to complete it. A lot of times, in, in, especially in churches or wherever you might be as a group, it's hard to think of God's word as being personal. You know, we talk and we preach to the church. But the most important thing is the Bible is written not to the church. It was written to you. You personally. Sometimes we feel like God doesn't see us, doesn't hear us. He hears the church 
And God does things in the church, but maybe he's not doing something for me. The truth is, he cares about you. He sees you. He knows what you're going through. He's not concerned about the church. He's concerned about the individuals in the church. If you feel like God's not there, remember I'll never leave you or forsake you. If you feel like, feel like God can't use you, remember God can use anyone. God's already got your life mapped out for you. He's got a plan for you to accomplish. And the question is, do we believe it? And do we live that way? Or do we live in constant fear that what we're doing is wrong and we're doing it our own way? God encourages us, don't be discouraged where you are. This church was struggling And God yet is telling them, don't be discouraged. It's not over until it's over. And God will continue to use each one of you individually to accomplish his main goal. As you saw in the past, out all the names that are involved in in every ministry of this church. God uses everyone. Everyone is a God-anointed position that God uses to facilitate our church. Without any of them, things would not get accomplished the way they get accomplished now. Things that we take for granted because if someone doesn't show up or if someone doesn't, doesn't do what they have the burden to do, we all miss out. And so when God says, I'm going to use you, it's not only to use you for your family. God is going to use you to bless others, to encourage others, to let others see something in you. That's why God's encouraging this church. He's got another assignment. You think think that they would say, God, this is enough. We're getting beat up here. Don't have anything. God says, no, you're not done. You're not done until I'm until I come back. And so regardless of where we are in our walk with Christ, God's not done. God's not done with any of us. And God still has yet much to accomplish. And he says, with me, you are able to do it. Would you stand this morning? We'll finish it up next week. When God's talking to the church, he opens up with encouragement. That tells me we all need encouragement from time to time. We all need God to speak into our lives, whether it's through a sermon, whether it's through a song, whether it's through just conversation with somebody else. It always lifts my spirit to hear something from somebody else that confirms what God's doing in me. And I'm sure we're all the same way. When you read something in God's word that just at that moment just ministers to you, that's the Holy Spirit ministering to you through God's word. Would you close your head and close your eyes and bow your head this morning? Yeah, close your head. That's what people say we do. We close our minds. A little Freudian slip there. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you love us and care for us more than we can imagine. And even when we forget things that we already know, you encourage us. Even when we think that you're not responding the way we think you should, you remind us that you love us and you care for us. And nothing happens that you don't know about. You open the doors of our lives, Father, to allow us to experience great things for you. And you close the doors in our lives to protect us and keep us from doing things we shouldn't be doing. And we want those doors to remain open and closed so that, God, our life will be pointed and directed the way you want us to go. Maybe you're here this morning before we close, before, you're, before we leave this morning. Maybe you're here, you've never 
really accepted Christ, you've been to church, you know it, you've heard it, but you've never come to the point where you say, I need Jesus to forgive me of my sin. I need to be born again. All these things we're talking about and how God cares for you and loves you, that's all true and that's for everyone. But we have to reciprocate. We have to simply say yes. God's word says as many as receive him. Did he give the authority or the right to be called children of God? If you're here this morning and you've never really done that, you've never come to Christ and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I know I'm not going to make it. I know my life isn't what it should be. Forgive me of that. And Lord, make me new. If that's you and you want to be made new, I want you to raise your hand right now. All right, I'm going to assume that we are all committed believers. But as any committed believer, we, I'm sure, struggle sometimes day to day. And the good point is God already knows that. God knew that before it even happened. God knows that you're going to blow it next week. God knows that you're going to fail at some point in five years from now. But the amazing part is God chose you anyway. He knows all your failures, not only in the past, but even the ones that we're going to commit after we've been forgiven. And God says, yes, I still want you. I still have a plan for you. I still can accomplish great things with you because I love you. Father, I pray you would fill each person here with that love right now. Allow us to experience in our spirit, Lord. We know it in our head, but help us experience that in our spirit and in our heart. The love you have for us, the promises in your word that are true, that keep us going from day to day when when life seems to want to beat us down. God, we are renewed and re-energized because your word tells us that you're there. That you have authority, you're in control, nothing happens that's beyond your ability to change. I pray your blessings upon each one as we leave today and help us to experience that daily in our lives. The strength of God flowing up through us and giving us the encouragement and the peace that we shouldn't experience. But God, you fill us with that, so we do. We love you this morning, God. We commit ourselves to you. Where else are we going to go, Lord? Who else has the words of eternal life? Who else has the promises of God? So, Father, we gladly submit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. 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 Have a great week. Let me know what God is doing in your life. I'm going to get Marion up here pretty soon and give a testimony.